Can you start? All right, I have, uh, so welcome everybody. Um, this is webinar three of our four-part series on the, the AASHTO Transportation Asset Management Guide to focus on implementation. Uh, my name is Matt Hardy. I'm the Program Director for Planning and Policy here at AASHTO, and I want to welcome everybody. Um, a, a few housekeeping issues uh, before we start. The first thing to note is that this is being recorded. Um, and it will be available hopefully tomorrow um, if you want to go back and, and listen to it again. It will be up on the uh, website uh, tam.transportation.org. You can already go uh, download or listen to or watch um, webinars one and two if you, if you weren't able to make those. They are available for you there. Um, uh, logistically, uh, please do not put your phone on hold. Uh, we, we just had that happen. When somebody puts us on hold, they sometimes have background music, which sort of comes over the line. And if that, if that happens, which it does, I just want to re uh, repeat this for some of the uh, uh, presenters. Um, everybody right now is on um, listen-only mode. If you're a speaker, uh, when you get ready to speak, please plan on hitting star six uh, to, to unmute your phone so that you can um, say something. Um, when you do, as the screen says, please please do mute your phone. You can either mute your phone by, if you have a mute button on your phone, you can hit that, or you can hit star six on, on your phone's keypad, and that will mute you, mute you as well as if you hit star six, it will unmute your phone as well, um, a, a little toggle. And if for some reason you cannot view the uh, full screen, um, the entire slide, um, if, you hit, if you press F5, it will go into full screen mode. And then to get out of that, you hit the escape. Again, F5 and escape for the toggles um, uh, between full screen and not full screen. So again, uh, I want to thank everybody for, for joining us. This is a uh, joint effort between AASHTO and FHWA. And I guess I want to turn it over to Steve Gay from uh, FHWA to, to say a few things as well. So this is Steve Gay from the Office of Asset Management at Federal I welcome you all to this webinar, like Matt indicated, third or four on the new asset management guide, a focus on implementation. I'm really excited about this particular webinar on the asset management plan in that there aren't many states and others actually doing the asset management plans as included in the guide today, and it wasn't really covered in the first actual guide. What the asset management plan is going to cover is talking about performance goals, inventories, current performance levels, performance gaps, undertaking the economic analysis, a risk analysis, developing a financial plan, and in turn developing a asset management strategy as included in the asset management plan. I'm just really excited about this with some great presentations and examples. And what we were talking yesterday as we were preparing for this is probably in the first half of 2012, we may have another webinar on the asset management plans. But at this point, let me turn it over to Yana Park from SpyPond, and let's get started. Yana? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. All right. Um, welcome, everyone, and I'm looking forward to uh, the next hour and a half with you. And um, with me, um, you've already heard from Matt Hardy and Steve Gay, but we also have several others who are helping to uh, be instructors in today's webinar. Mark Gordon from AECOM, he's actually calling in from um, Australia. And um, Scott Richrack from Colorado DOT, Casey Larkin Thomason from Nevada DOT, Pat Morin from Washington State DOT, and Jeff Price from Virginia DOT. And I'll introduce each of these folks just before their part uh, of the presentation. Um, we're all here today to learn about the Transportation Asset Management Guide. And many of you, I think most of you, have been on the other webinar, so I'm not going to go through this in detail. But really, this guide is designed to be, uh, 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 to provide you with guidance. You can look at it as a recipe book. It provides um, cases, examples, and it's really geared to help you get more from the resources you have to meet your strategic objectives. Um, 
We are in webinar three, the first two webinars. Um, the first one was called Applying the Guide, and we went through several scenarios of how you could use the guide. Um, the last webinar, webinar two, was an overview of the guide and, and went through the steps um, that you could um, go to get started to be prepared to really launch an asset management program. And today, as Steve just mentioned, we're focusing on the Transportation Asset Management Plan, which is a critical component of the, the guide's approach to implementing better asset management. And our next webinar, which will be two weeks from now at the exact same time with the same call information and links, uh, will be on tools and techniques for implementing the asset management plan. Today, what we're going to do is um, give you an understanding of the role that the asset management plan will will uh, play in um, improving asset management in your organization. Uh, we're going to touch on um, the the concept of levels of service and the role it will play um, in your planning and implementation, and and we'll go through some of the various ways that the asset management plan can be developed, and we'll hear from folks who've gone through an asset management plan exercise, and you'll see that there's just, there's not one right, one right way. There are multiple ways to develop an asset management plan, and we hope that you'll see those various ways. Um, so we're going to start with an introduction of how the asset management uh, fits into your overall asset management activities. Uh, we'll go through an introduction of the levels of service, and then we'll go into uh, the meat of the webinar on developing and using an asset management plan, and then we'll have some examples, and then questions and answers, and wrap up. And um, Matt, I'm just going to, um, do you want to just explain the process for asking questions? Yeah, sorry, I, I forgot about that. So uh, the, 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 the way to, answer, to ask questions is at the top of your screen, you'll, you'll see some, uh, a little button uh, that says Q&A, and that's the best way to go up there and, and type your uh, questions. Um, that way we can have a record of them, and uh, at, the, at the very end, when it's uh, time for the Q&A, I would just sort of go down the uh, list of questions and read them out, and if needed, uh, and if, there, if there's need, uh, follow-up is needed, then I'll, I'll tell that that person to sort of unmute their phone and, um, you know, ask their question or, or uh, provide clarification or whatever. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to um, repeat a couple of slides I've used in the past webinars. This is the, the Asset Management Guide Roadmap, the 14 steps to implementation. And, um, and as I've highlighted here, today's webinar is focused on the development of the Asset Management Plan, and it's Chapter 4 in the guide. The entire chapter is about developing your transportation asset management plan. Um, Mark Gordon, at the last webinar, went through each of the chapters of the Asset Management Guide, and, and here is the, the slide that describes what's in the, the Chapter 4 of the Asset Management Guide, why you would want to um, develop a Transportation Asset Management Guide, uh, the hows and what of and updating the plan, and how you would link your plan to your everyday business and then, um, and then specifically how you can use the guide to develop the plan itself. Um, this is another graphic I've shown in both of the previous webinars, which, you know, is very uh, one of the essential components of the guide, which is about how you um, go from where you are today to your desired state in the future. Uh, you develop an improvement plan and you implement it, and you repeat that cycle. And, and the asset management plan is the complement, compilation of your improvement plan, and we'll talk about that in greater detail as we move forward in this webinar. So um, let's, um, before we dive into the asset management plan, one of the key concepts in the guide and is an essential component of the asset management plan is 
uh, levels of service. So I'd like to introduce Mark Gordon, who was the principal investigator for the MCHRP project that produced this guide, and he's going to take us through an overview of levels of service. Mark? Uh, thanks, Diana. Uh, and everyone, hello, everyone. Uh, and, and levels of service, really, uh, it's an important part, and it, it's really where you start your journey with the, uh, with the asset management plan. Uh, and it's all about really what your customers, what your users um, expect, what service do they um, need on the network. Um, some key points here on the slide and, and amongst them, um, the fact that uh, the levels of service are derived from your business objectives. Uh, there should be a line of sight back to your mission. Uh, and then right down through the three levels, uh, down through the customer levels of service and technical levels of service. Um, they've got to be smart. You need to be able to measure them, obviously, where you get the link to your performance management, performance measures framework. Um, so there's some criteria there for you know, how you need to be able to measure them. Um, ideally, uh, you get customer feedback, find out through surveys or talking to people uh, what is it that you kind of expect of us. Um, but and, and there's a number of tools you can actually use that the guide explains uh, as you're going through. Uh, and as I'll just talk about in the next slide, uh, sometimes you actually need to start with what you know rather than what you don't know. Uh, the last point um, is important because you know, this is just kind of this line of sight, this alignment uh, with your business objectives right through to what you're delivering on the ground. Next. Um, so if, you, if you've identified your customer levels of service, um, how does this now translate to physical measures? You know, the things that you do on the ground. And, and, and this is how we define what it is that your engineers and your service providers need to do to ensure that they're delivering the things uh, that the customer expects and ultimately allow you to achieve your goals. So um, every technical level of service, every technical measure uh, should link uh, to a customer level of service. And there's some examples there around roughness, which equates to I expect the road to be smooth when I drive on it, or skid resistance which means I feel safe, my vehicle isn't going to skid off the road uh, if I put the brakes on. And the last point there is to say that when you're in the early stages uh, of asset management, you know you might not have done that consultation with your customers, but you will know what your technical measures are, you will know what the things are that you're doing. And so the exercise becomes one of working backwards, if you like, to how do I express this in a way that my customers can understand and then I can talk to them about it. Next. And this picture, when it comes up, um, is a bit of a graphic of that. And if you can imagine you start across at the right-hand side, the technical levels of service, the things that I know that I do now, and you can move it across to the left. This is for sidewalks. You can move it across to the left and define well, what, what might it be for, from a customer's point of view. What are the things that he's trying to looking for, he or she? And how do I express that? All right, and then you can go right back to the far left, which might be the strategic objectives um, of your organisation. Um, as I said before, ideally you, you would start with what is it the customer is expecting? You know, those outcomes in the middle. I arrive safe. It's easy to walk on. It's clean. And then you can you can further develop that in terms of your customer levels of service and your technical levels of service. Next. Thank you, Mark, and we'll hear from Mark later on the New Zealand Transfer Case Study. Um, now I'd like to introduce Skip Scott Richrath, who is the Performance and Policy Analysis Unit Manager from the Colorado Department of Transportation. And Colorado has been on a long journey with maintenance levels of service, and, and he's going to share their experience. And I noticed that Mike Marco is on the call, and he actually was the person who long ago um, in implementing this program. Thank Scott. you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. And before I get into this slide, and in fact, I'm not going to go through every bullet on this particular slide, but before I do that, I just wanted to, at risk of sounding like I have a royalty from the asset management guide, put in a plug for the book, because we're hearing from great speakers throughout the states on what they've already done prior to publication of this book. And, and we've done a lot as well, but we want
wanted to use this book to really take a second look at what we're doing in all of our various assets and determine what we could be doing better by picking up best practices from other states. So we actually started a transportation asset management guide book club here at CDOT. And every two weeks we get together and folks are expected to have read uh, that particular meeting's chapter. They're assigned that chapter. And we, we go through, we highlight things that we think we're doing well today already in Colorado, things that we picked up from other states or from the guide where we could be doing a better job, and how we can use the information from the guide to really impact projects we're on today that help shape um, the asset management that we wanted to. I just wanted to um, commend FHWA and AASHTO for putting together really a great reference book. And if other states are like us in Colorado, so much of your day is consumed with putting out a fire or meeting tomorrow's need that you don't get enough time to kind of take a step back and actually look at what other states are doing and how to implement perhaps improved strategies in your own state. We decided it was worth our time to take an hour every two weeks and do exactly that. We had to build it into our schedules in order to do it, but it's helping us kind of take a fresh look at what we're doing here in Colorado. So with that said, um, much of what I'll talk about here on maintenance levels of service really pertains a lot to Chapter 4 and a little bit to Chapter 5. As Mark pointed out, there's a, there's a technical level of service and a customer level of service. And sometimes the connection is more difficult to make than, than one would think. And in fact, communicating the technical level of service, which, which we believe we understand and communicate well internally here at our Department of Transportation, but getting that message out to the customer can often be difficult. And so that's a topic that we're struggling with and we continue to improve on today and in fact have meetings on regularly to determine how can we better make the connection between uh, the level of service that the customer experiences and the level of service that we feel we have a pretty good understanding of when we go out and do a bridge inspection or when we go out and uh, check the condition of our pavement. In the maintenance area at CDOT, you know, unlike bridge and pavement where our performance measures and our, our asset management are very much condition level driven or technically driven, our maintenance activities are very much level of service driven. In fact, um, I would say that we do a better job of keeping track of the customer experience than we do of the traditional asset management of physical location and inventory and, you know, when was that guardrail last bid or by a motor vehicle. Uh, we're perhaps I'd give ourselves, you know, a, a C to B grade on the asset management or technical condition of our maintenance activities and our safety assets such as guardrail and striping and signs. But I'd say we do a really good job of going out with, with crews um, from other maintenance sections within the state of Colorado and doing kind of a third party uh, objective view of the various maintenance activities that we do at CDOT. So really, on this particular slide, the, the point I want to stress is in that last bullet, the relationships between levels of service and cost enable us here in Colorado to evaluate the impacts of different funding levels, analyze trade-offs and resource allocation, and monitor planned versus actual accomplishments against expenditures. So what we're doing with our maintenance level of service program, which is separate from our bridge program and our pavement program, is we know going into any given year um, what our budget's going to be for our overall maintenance program, and then we break that down into nine maintenance program areas. In Colorado, our largest program area happens to be snow and ice removal. We spend about $60 million of our $240 million annual maintenance budget just removing snow and ice. And to give you an overview, our total budget is about a billion dollars. So about 25% of our annual budget is dedicated to these maintenance activities I'm talking about now. And of that, 25% is dedicated just to snow and ice removal. Well, what's the asset with snow and ice removal? It's a plow truck. Does the public really care about the condition of our plow truck? Our, our maintenance equipment happens to be, from an asset condition standpoint, at 170% of useful life. So if our plow trucks are expected to get 
uh, 20 years of service. Our, our average plow truck today is um, 20, do math, 20 times 0.7, so we're running, you know, over 30 years uh, average age on our plow trucks today. Does the public care about that? We've determined that they don't. What they care about is what their commute looks like during a snowstorm on the state highways of Colorado. So our crews uh, go behind the actual plow trucks, and they, they have a very specified grading system for uh, whether we have um, ruts remaining after a plow pass, for whether it's completely clear, for whether the snow has still piled right along the shoulder stripe. And we have A, B, C, D, F levels of grade for that particular activity, and we grade ourselves. And we compile that grading system, and we determined, we determined um, once the year is over, okay, we achieved on average this level of service for snow and ice removal. How much did it cost us to do that? We had a $60 million budget. We ended up, let's say, running over budget due to conditions, perhaps due to weather conditions. It cost us $62 million. Um, and we achieved a level B minus. Well, in a, one given year, we might get more or less snow than the average year, but over time, we compile that data, we track that data, and we're able to smooth out abnormalities and determine going into the next year, okay, if we want to deliver to the customers minus level of service again, here's about what it's going to cost. And so that's how our um, maintenance program works. And so you can go to the next slide. And you'll see here then what we present to our decision makers. Uh, we present um, historical information of, of how well we did in a particular area from a level of service standpoint, that is from the standpoint that the customer experiences, not the technical condition of the asset. We're not showing any information here about, you know, how, how strong, how sturdy, how old, how new, how much are we spending on repairing that plow truck or that or any of the equipment involved with our maintenance activities. We're talking about specifically the customer's level of service that they're experiencing. So we set a goal for ourselves each year, given a known budget amount, and then at the end of the year we compile and we, we ask ourselves how well did we do and do we need to adjust our budget up or down. And at the same time, we recalibrate the anticipated cost to achieve the various levels of service. So this is what the commission sees. This is what um, the governor's office sees, and this is what our legislature sees through the mandated strategic plan that we have to submit every year related to assets at the Colorado Department of Transportation. So you can go to the next slide. And so I think a lot of you are asking, okay, you know, we're used to, we're used to talking in terms of structural uh, integrity or structural deficiency and functional obsolescence on bridges. We're used to talking in terms of remaining service life on pavement. Isn't it a lot more of a gray area when you start scoring yourself and giving yourself an A, B, C, D, or F level of grade? Well, we've tried to eliminate as much gray as we could, and through the work that was done on this project that Huna referenced earlier um, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, we set forth guidelines that we expect everyone to follow, and they actually have a report card and a scoring system for assessing that report card. So whereas one of our nine program areas is snow and ice removal, and we literally have pictures of what the highway looks like after a snowplow pass in order to achieve those grades, here are the pictures we have for roadway surface, which is, is maintenance of roadway surface It's your it's your uh, more quick hit types of maintenance activities on your pavement, not your uh, larger treatment such as resurfacing or reconstruction, but more chip seals and things like that. So we give ourselves a grade on the roadway surface in order to determine um, what's the impact after we conduct a maintenance activity for the roadway surface. We come through, we inspect, and we say, you know, we were operating at a D level, and for $60 million statewide, we were able to improve that to a C plus, for example. So we have this sort of report card or scoring system for all nine program activities, and maintenance crews will actually, will actually take the time and we'll dedicate the resources to sending them to other maintenance patrols in order to inspect and score the activities of their counterparts in other geographic areas of, of the state.
You can go to the next slide. Thank you, Scott. Um, so let's now uh, focus our attention on the asset on the transportation asset management plan. And this diagram shows you how the transportation asset management plan is really a, a hub of connections to activities that are going on within your agency. So at the top of the diagram, you see the, all the various plans that you generate, business plans, strategic plans, financial plans, and that that is the context that then feeds to the development of a transportation asset management plan where you focus on prioritizing and and um, determining what activities you are going to undertake to support the plans you have throughout your agency and the enabling ways that you're going to make that happen. So, so the transportation asset management plan, you may call it something different, but really is uh, a, a focal point of enabling you to be successful in asset management. So what is a transportation asset management plan? And um, the, the guide uses a uh, definition that the Transport Scotland um, uses, which is um, one of them, one of the definitions is to set out an agreed upon um, work and financial plan for the road network it describes how the agency will manage these assets. Um, it, it describes the use of applications of uh, good asset management practice. And ultimately, you're going to be able to deliver customer expectations and deliver on the plans that you have throughout the agency. And so um, what a transportation asset management plan does is it, it provides you with a key tool to help you meet the strategic objectives you've set out to, to accomplish. And it becomes a focal point for information that um, you collect about your assets, your investment strategies, and, and the, the ways you're going to manage your assets. And it provides you with a best practice context and coordination of complex issues. As, as you can see so far with the webinars from your experience, um, uh, um, an asset management program is a complex set of activities throughout your agency. And a key element is its, um, its ability to help you cut through the silos and work better together to accomplish the results you're seeking. Um, the, the plan also helps you communicate both internally and externally. And, and it becomes, once you implement it and maintain the plan, it becomes a robust repository of your asset management um, information. And, and finally, and very importantly, it is a mechanism that reinforces continuous improvement in your agency. Um, now I'd like to um, introduce Pat Morin from the Washington State DOT. He's the asset management manager there. And he's going to share with us the legislative context for asset management. Um, I worked with Pat back in the early 90s as they were partnering with their legislature and implementing the, a lot of the foundational elements of what they are benefiting Today in having a one of the most robust asset management uh, programs in the country. Pat. Hey, thanks, Hyuna. Uh, as Hyuna mentioned, um, Washington State's journey began back in the early 1990s as part of a revenue package that was passed by our legislature. As part of that, they uh, wanted to evaluate how the department was identifying transportation needs for both improvements as well as preserving existing assets to see if there were some improvements. And out of that came some specific recommendations that the department implemented. The one that you can see on the um, screen in front of you is that they wanted to be really clear that um, all of our transportation needs or deficiencies were based on factual information. And so, um, 
as part of this effort, they actually began re um, requiring that these this process be followed as part of state law. And you can get more information on what what they asked of us at um, at our at their webpage under the Revised Code of Washington, Chapter 4705, and the address is there. Uh, next slide. So then, one of the main tenets of what they were really trying to accomplish is that they had come to a clear recognition that there wasn't going to be enough money to preserve the assets and the function that they provide, as well as to provide improvements in the area of congestion relief, safety, environmental retrofit, and economic So they wanted to make sure that they were going to get the maximum bang for their buck, and that's the efficiency. They wanted to make sure that every dollar that they invested in transportation capital projects was going to provide them the greatest amount of performance. They also wanted to ensure that we were checking our assumptions to ensure that strategies that we were bringing forth to get that were in effect effective. Next slide, please. So one of the things that they also instituted uh, in the late 1990s is they asked the governor to begin performing a annual transportation or status of performance of key indicators on the capital side. And so um, a few years ago, um, the governor issued, um, began issuing an annual report on the performance of our asset management for both pavements and bridges as well as safety and congestion relief. In addition to that, the department began um, issuing its own performance report to the public every three months. And we, as part of that, put out a specific edition for pavement uh, preservation as well as structure preservation and other facility preservation on an annual basis and we stagger them so that we're not reporting on them all in the same quarter. So at the height of it is that we want to make sure that both the legislature, the governor, and the public are fully aware of how the existing assets are performing, where we're going in the future, and what we've accomplished in the last year. Next slide, please. Let's talk more specifically then about another requirement. They, they wanted us to look for cost-effective strategy. And so as part of our process here at the department, we sit down with our technical experts and we begin asking them, now that they've identified a transportation need, what are the types of solutions that will get us the most pavement performance and We've identified performance as the amount of rutting to ensure that it doesn't exceed a maximum amount, the amount of cracking, the, uh, the ride skid resistance. And when they no longer meet those performance criteria, they are identified as a transportation need. And that ties back to the level of service or expectations that were established in, in our first presentation today. Um, and what we then work with our technical experts, how do you get that performance back for the least amount of money? And so you can see here that um, we're going to work through it with each one of our pavement types, both flexible pavement as well as rigid, to look for those cost-effective solutions. A big part of this is how can we extend that performance by using maintenance, actually hiring maintenance in the capital program to make cost-effective strategies to get more life out of it. Next slide. We're going to do something very similar on our bridges as well. As part of working with our bridge planning manager, we learned early on that um, from the life cycle cost analysis that we are going to get better performance for every dollar we spend by preserving our bridges um, against um, 
corrosion, either from the paint rusting away or from the deck protective systems uh, and replacing deteriorated members rather than waiting to replace them entirely. So for the Department of Transportation, we put our maximum emphasis in this area of preservation um, by painting our steel bridges, by putting on deck protective systems, by ensuring that bridges that are susceptible to scour um, are retrofitted in an environmentally friendly manner. By doing that, we believe that what it will do is give us the maximum numbers of years of life and performance for the least amount of money. The other area that we look at uh, is seismic protection. Our Puget Sound sits in one of the higher ground motion acceleration zones in the United States. And we did not have enough money to go in and protect every bridge within the state of Washington. So we sat down with our emergency um, management department as well as our emergency management planners in each one of our major metropolitan areas in the Puget Sound and identified a network of lifeline routes to ensure that essential supplies for emergency response as well as a network of key routes to allow the state of Washington to get back into a full um, and vibrant economy as quickly as possible following a major seismic event was possible. By doing that, we narrowed it down to a specific set of routes and then began looking for cost-effective solutions to get them, the bridges within them retrofitted as quickly as possible. So we're using the cost-benefit principles to get the maximum life, and then each strategy is being implemented in a sequence in order to get maximum life. This begins to lay the foundation then for our um, asset management plan, and we develop it with multiple options to ensure that, depending on the amount of money we receive from the legislature, we can predict year by year what our proposed performance will be. Back to you, Hyuna. Thanks, Pat. And that's um, a good lead-in for um, getting back to what is the plan. You know, essentially, um, as Pat just described, the asset management plan is what, what enables you to take the strategies that you've developed and make them into reality. I think we all know that there are a lot of cases in our industry where strategies are developed and planned, but the connection to actual implementation is weaker, and which is why um, Steve Gay mentioned at the beginning of the webinar the concept of of the asset management, the transportation asset management plan being a much more integral part of day-to-day -day, um, DOT agency life is really an important component of how we hope the asset management guide will influence um, improved performance um, in, of transportation. So. Um, so what does the, the actual document look like? Uh, many are single documents that are focused on specific item, aspect of what you want to improve. So for instance, for um, uh, Washington State, um, implementing the pavement strategies, the structure strategies, those can be then um, independent documents that are um, improvement plans that build towards a, a set of uh, a statewide document, maybe the, of which the, the statewide document is a smaller summary with many of these multiple. Or you can have just one plan if you have uh, one coordinated effort. So it can, uh, the, the document itself can come in multiple forms, um, large and small. Um, and so, um, oh, and here you can see, you can think about it as a, a library that, um, that has multiple components to it, 
and um, and in fact, um, the New, New Zealand Transport Agency um, has 55 manuals. That date, that might be an old fact, and, and um, Mark Gordon is going to tell us a little bit more about their approach and their current status with their asset management plan. And um, and so let's continue here and move to the actual content. And here, these are suggested components, and these are all taken from the guide itself. And um, so one major area of content will be goals and levels of service. So it's very much like what Pat just went through for pavements and structures for Washington State for um, specific access pieces. Um, you can also look at uh, broad agency performance measures of where assets will support um, how you can meet those objectives. Um, if you can have um, risk-related um, assessments and performance. You can have program delivery performance and sustainability as another com component. Another major category in the management plan is um, growth and demand is to say um, that you need to include in it the forecasting of why you need the, the activities uh, today to be able to meet what your future situation is going to look like. And Scott Rattraff later is going to share with us uh, uh, another Colorado case study related to that that's included in the guide. Um, then a third component of the asset management plan is a financial summary where you have financial information on valuation, depreciation, your approach to on the GASB 34, and um, and then also including your constrained annual and longer term program. Um, then you have a section that talks about the practices that you're going to use to implement um, your your priorities, and then and then the actual plan itself. What are you actually going to do to improve um, your performance in your agency? And, and appendices. And here, the appendices can be larger than um, the document itself. And I'll just show you in a minute the, um, the Scottish one where uh, one of the appendices is their asset inventory. Um, um, these two examples of tables of content for an asset management plan are included in the guide. And so you can see that Scottish one has uh, 14 chapters and three um, different appendices. Um, and the New Zealand one, which we'll hear from Mark later, um, is uh, 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 less um, chapters. Uh, but but is also quite extensive in that there are many many um, volumes that support that asset management plan. But these are things that are intended to help you as you set out to develop your own asset management plan um, as um, as an example of how you can approach it. And um, and m many of these documents, uh, the full documents, are available on the web um, should you want to look at them. The other component of the asset management planning that's critical is who is involved in the development of it. Um, just by the nature of asset management being a integrative, cross siloed um, uh, coordinator, uh, coordinating element, you need to have a lot of people involved. And so while you need the, the, the core asset management team, because you, we all know if you have too big of a group, it may be hard to actually get a document. You need to balance that tension between a focused, um, actionable uh, approach to getting the plan completed with making sure that all of the stakeholders and parties who need to be involved are at the table or are engaged so that they buy in and are part of the team that helps implement the, the plan itself. So, um, so you have a core asset management team that develops the guide. 
You, you identify internal stakeholders. Um, they may come in the form of a steering committee or a C, um, you may have already an established senior management group. And then you also uh, have to consider your external stakeholders, your um, political bodies, the legislators, uh, your governors. Um, and um, if you have a commission, you have your coordination with federal highway and other interest groups. And, and now more and more agencies, and as we talked about the, the customer levels of service, really factoring in the customer as your ultimate audience in the work you're doing to make these improvements. So now I'd like to introduce Tracy Larkin-Thomason. Um, Tracy is um, the head of planning for Nevada DOT, and she was an active panel member at the 8-69 project, and she's going to um, um, talk about the, the asset management plan business process context. Tracy. Can you hear me? Tracy? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Hello. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. I think it's afternoon in most places. Um, I would like to quickly go through this um, flowchart right here. And one thing I wanted to kind of really reiterate is that, you know, the TMP, it really has to be across the board. And that was across the board in the agency. And in Nevada, we are still in the implementation stage. We're not as advanced as some other states, so it's more of the awakening. And some of the struggles going through is getting the department to recognize that it's a department-wide plan that you're working on. It's not just maintenance. It's not just one or two areas. It's really a whole program. And we've made great strides, but sometimes the beginning of it, you do need to work through the culture of the agency. So if you start in here and on the monitoring performance, you, know, you do an honest self-assessment. Really look at the regulatory requirements. Um, Nevada, like most states, has a very robust pavement management system and bridge system. We're not as good in some of the other areas of managing or tracking them. So taking a good inventory of the physical assets and the processes that we use to monitor them, the processes that we use to project projects to take care of them. Really looking at how we determine our project priorities. Also looking at the legislative compliance needs. And in Nevada, we have several legislatively determined performance measures, and how do we incorporate our plan with that. So move on to, like, to performance, and I think it's also important to notice it's not always a clear cut. You're going to finish one, go to two, go to three, go to four. You're usually in different parts of the agencies will be in different parts of this at different times. But this shows very well how to develop it and move and then cycle back. On performance, Identifying the performance requirements. Where does your agency want to be? What are your goals and objectives? You know, you've heard many already about the customer expectations. Um, you know, the public and the decision makers, their expectations. And sometimes you need to analyze, do some of those expectations need to change? You know, you've heard about, you know, measuring the level of service against funding categories. That's reality. It's a particular real, real in today's economy. Um, so information. And also, the information and the flows of information in these. As you move through for the, the data management in this area and how you're getting through is really important. How you pull this stuff together as you take your inventory, your conditions, your performance, and you do the flows of information, the data management, and that data flow and stuff, it really flows in all of these areas, and it's really big stumbling blocks that we've had in Nevada. We're overhauling the data management system and getting that communication flowing from one area to another. I recognize some of these seem very basic, but sometimes in a large organization, some of the very basic things of improving communication can be major, major areas to work through. When you look at the resource constraints on the human resources, you're looking at short-term resources, and also long-term resources. Are they just looking at constraints of just the physical human resource? Are you also looking at constraints in different 
technical areas as you progress through the plan. So you have the skill sets to take it to the next level. Um, and certainly your long-term funding prior priority and pricing. When you work into the finding your optimal life cycle solution, you know, working on, we're working on program needs, processes, and project development um, from, that are developed from the asset analysis. Again, how do we balance competing needs in here? Um, operational improvements, how do we bring those type of things and categorize, categorize them to work in with the more, um, the other types of management, your payment management, the other competing needs. Moving on to the asset current, the, the asset management practice. Again, the honest self-assessment. You know, your business strategy. How are we doing business? And communication is a key. It's a major key. And again, the management of data and information is critical. So we are also looking in this area, we're doing the thing of looking at the skill sets in certain areas. And are we willing to change business practices? And yes, we're willing to change business practices, but how do we change those business practices and still progress and take care of business as we have it now? Identifying the process movement, you know, we're looking overall, NDOT is looking at all different levels. We're looking at the overall look department view of the TAMP, TAMP, but we're also, as we just determine the gaps and the areas of deficiencies, we have smaller areas going to improve, um, looking at individual program areas and process areas. So we have the 50,000 foot view going on, and concurrently we have very specific discipline areas going in. But it's very important that we, as we move forward, that we're keeping the coordination and making sure that each of the individuals is feeding up into the whole. So then, Voila, and you kind of come up here and you have a transportation asset management plan. But as you move into there, it is not a static achievement. It, it's an ongoing achievement. You go on, you, so you agree on the work program, you determine far out as you can get into your work program and your program delivery, and then it feeds right back into you're still monitoring the performance. You identify performance requires that they may change. Are your goals changing? Has what you have accomplished, has that appropriately achieved the goal you were after? And again, it goes right back into the three, four, five, right back into your flow chart and continues on. The next one, please. I think it's really very self-explanatory, and I think it gives a good representation of on the top part showing the input, the type of things that you're going to bring in to your transport management plan, your policies, your strategies, uh, your service, your forecasting, your financial part, um, your business plan of where you want to go, your physical asset life cycle, and then what you come out at the end, basically coordinating all those things coming in and then putting out on the end your improvement plans, your life cycle management plans, delivering your program is on there. I know that was kind of quick, but that's what I have. Thank you, Tracy. Um, now um, I'm going to reintroduce Scott. He, uh, he is going to share with us the Colorado case study that's included in the guide and um, and the traffic growth analysis. Uh, ah. Thank you, Juna. Uh, previously, I spoke to our maintenance level of service program and, and mentioned that's about 25% of our annual budget, and it's very customer service uh, driven rather than condition driven. Um, our pavement management program, which is above and beyond the routine maintenance activities that we dedicate to roadway surface um, is another 10 to 15 percent of the program. And, and Huna mentions um, on page 425, we actually depicted the growth of traffic volume 
uh, within Colorado compared to the growth of population for purposes of developing our long-range plan, and that appears on page 425 of the Asset Management Guide. And, and the point I want to get across there is since the early 1990s, we have enveloped into the formula that recommends surface types to the pavement system. Equivalent single axle loads is a way of capturing current and anticipated traffic on within each uh, segment of our pavement. So whereas the maintenance level of service program measures simply only what the customer sees or only what our maintenance crews that go and, and score their counterparts see as a measure of following up on those different nine program areas. The pavement management program that we have in Colorado actually builds into the formula the equivalent single axle loads, which for, for us in Colorado is our surrogate of traffic volume, in order to recommend the most effective treatment type for each particular segment. Um, page 539 of the Asset Management Guide talks about this, this balance you have to achieve, and it talks about condition being measured in cracking and scabbing and potholes and lots of friction and roughness. But it also talks about the level of service, the availability, capacity, delivery, and other agreed levels of service. And we consider this important enough in Colorado that we not only use the right factors in determining what sorts of treatment we recommend for our pavement, that last week we had a two-hour sit-down meeting with the executive director and chief engineer, and we, we opened up that formula that isn't a whole lot of we together 15 years ago, and we asked ourselves again the question, based on what we've heard in recent customer surveys of, are we, are we capturing all of the appropriate information um, that, our, that our customers demand for a level of service on the pavement program and that we know about the condition side of the surface? Go ahead and we recommend different surface treatment types. So what we've managed to do in Colorado is because, and I'm sure this is the case for most state DFDs, You've got your bridge program living in one particular system. Many of us are in Pontus. You have your um, pavement management program perhaps living in another system. And in our case, we have a maintenance level of service program living in yet a third system. Those three programs together encompass about 50% of all of our activities and 50% of all of our budget. Um, in November of 2006, we launched an enterprise resource planning package that captured the information from all of those systems in order to clearly depict to our decision makers, our policy makers, the impacts of financial and budgetary decisions, both, both in the short term and in the long term, of varying levels of investment on each of those programs. That's all I have on that slide. So this is, as I mentioned, the very graph that you'll see in the Asset Management Guide from page 425. And really, I was speaking to, for purposes of this, that solid line which depicts the growth that we anticipate in vehicle miles traveled in Colorado. This was put together in development of our long-range plan, which is our 2035 plan. So it's data that we saw from 2007-2008. Most of you, if you're like us, you saw that curve flatten as gasoline hit 3 and $4 a gallon and as the economy kept people from uh, driving quite as much as they had. So, so anticipating um, levels of service can be difficult when other external factors are involved that are beyond the control of the DOT. The dotted line simply was, was our uh, means of communicating that, you know, even if population grows and even if all the things that dictate revenue here in Colorado grow along with population, we're, we were still at that time witnessing demand on our roadways that was accelerating more rapidly than any of our revenue sources. And that's all for that slide. So I, I'll just quickly wrap it up that depending on the type of asset you're looking at, you have to achieve the right level of balance between condition and customer level of service. And in our bridge program, we're very much condition-driven. Uh, condition in our pavement program, we've achieved a level of balance. In our maintenance level of service program, we're very much customer service oriented. And that's all I have. Thank you, Scott.
So um, in Chapter 4 that uh, Scott was referencing, um, which is on the Asset Management Plan, there's a step-by-step -step guide um, that's diagrammed here on this slide of how you can walk through the development of an Asset Management Plan, um, starting from where you are conducting the self-assessment, uh, documenting uh, what you're doing now and, uh, and all of the activities you already have underway. I mean, you know, when you're in a DOT, this is going already, so you have to capture that moment. And in that moment, there are already plans in place, projects underway. Those have to be included. And then you want to, to identify what you want to achieve in the future, given the state you have and what's possible given the resources um, you have. Develop the improvement plan, prioritize them, then allocate the specific resources um, to those plans, and then and then actually use the plan to implement monitor its effectiveness, and then repeat this cycle um, again as you continue your um, improvement path. These next set of slides I'm just going to go through very quickly with you. They have a lot of detail on them. This is a uh, another diagram that's included in Chapter 4, which walks you through each of those steps that I just showed you in the previous slide in greater detail um, and associates with them uh, parts of the guide that has the reference material related to the, the recommended sub-steps. And so, um, so this is a, a pretty important macro diagram that you can use. And I'll just walk quickly through each of the components. So the first is really the preparation of yourself as the leader in the development of the asset management plan, your agency, and the team that's going to do it. And those are really related to, to steps one, two, three, and four, getting you ready getting all the pieces in place. Then you want to also make sure that the supporting uh, processes that are um, essential are also being taken care of, and that's included in the guide. And that has uh, data gathering and, and the, uh, the understanding of your activities uh, within um, the agency related to information management and, and data that's going to support your asset management planning. And then um, step five, six, and seven are really about writing the plan. How do you go and build the components of the plan that, uh, that is the foundation for the robust um, information and insights that you're going to use um, to implement your next set of activities related to asset management. And then one key step after you've written the plan is, is the plan affordable? And so um, you may take a first cut at this without having financial constraints and go through the next um, loop uh, with the financial constraints. Then uh, the, the final step is to implement and use the plan as guidance do, during your implementation and review periodically and then feed back to the beginning of the cycle again. And that's um, included in, um, in Chapter 4.3.5, which is where in the guide you'll find the specific guidance on this step. And, and then the other thing that, that is really important to make the connection, especially to the executives in your agency, is once you have an asset management plan that has all of the components that make it rich with information, rich with insight, uh, you want to use that to feed the other planning activities that are happening in your agency your strategic plan, your annual plan, various business planning, and annual reports. And so it becomes a vibrant and active component of your agency's day-to-day -day business process. Now I'd like to uh, reintroduce Mark Gordon. And he's going to describe the, the, the transportation asset management development path at the New Zealand Transport Agency, one of the leaders internationally 
um, in asset management, and Mark um, is actually uh, from New Zealand and has, and has worked closely with this agency. Mark. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Yana. And uh, yes, I guess it, it is very much. Uh, it's, it's been a matter of um, of a journey, um, an evolution path. Um, if we go back, you know, over the years, um, I think probably around '96, '97, I was in, when I started uh, life with consulting and moved on from the council role. And you know, NZTA or Transit as it was then was an organisation was quite new. Uh, you saw the image of all of the books on the bookshelf, and certainly they had lots of manuals, guides, strategies. Uh, procedures, etc. But you know, the, in New Zealand, the world was kind of moving to asset management plans as a way of doing things for local government. Um, and people at Transit said, "Well, maybe we've got to have a look at this. We're not sure, but let, let's have a look at it." Um, we don't really have a single place where we pull our strategy in and, and link it to our business operations, our day-to-day -day stuff, um, where we talk about our assets. So let's let's do that. Um, and they did. Uh, they produced the first plan, and really that was the first um, of several generations of plans. Um, quite an important loop. The, um, the agency has, uh, every five years, they develop a state highway strategy, which looks at the network and, and where it's going, who's it, you know, where the development might be, how the network should be developed and improved. And the, the asset management plan and that strategy actually sit very closely together. Uh, next slide. So this is a very, um, it's probably an early diagram actually, it's probably a couple of generations uh, old in fact. Um, but what it does is it also reflects that diagram uh, Hiana had earlier which sort of showed the amp in the middle and the strategy and what have you, driving it from the top and delivery and so forth underneath. Well just turn this one around 90 degrees and you can see you know, on the left-hand side, the, the State Highway Strategy, uh, the Statement of Intent, which is actually the government's directive, um, or the result of the government's directive, or the outcomes that the agency is going to achieve on behalf of the government, um, and seven key goals. So the Asset Management Plan brings that together, and it ties it to, you know, those, man those manuals out on the right-hand side, so it gives them a, a focus, and also on the far right-hand side, the outputs, you know, the at the end of the day, you know, what's the money, what are the budgets that we need to uh, to spend over time. Um, next slide. So probably a few years ago, um, six, seven, eight years ago maybe, um, it was recognised that, you know, the, the, the State Highway Plan was quite high level and we had some very specific um, and specialised assets out there, uh, namely bridges and intelligent transport systems. Bridges, I guess, because of you know, the complexity of structures, um, their long life. ITS, um, something quite different really, very short life, uh, high technology assets. So, you know, they need some kind of special management approaches. So, so two particular AMPs were actually developed for those two groups of assets. Um, now, where it's got to today is that um, NZTA is made up of a number of regions around the country, and it's very important to get, um, you know, the buy-in and involvement of people that are actually out in the regions, out of the coalface. So the way the process works today is that each region, this happens every three years, each region produces its own local asset management plan, which involves people uh, and identifies your key issues, identifies the services that you're delivering to the customers in your region, and one region will be different to another uh, because of geology and growth and so on. Um, and importantly, look at look at where the failures occur, what's the risk of failure uh, interrupting our service and provide um, a robust justification uh, for what you're doing in your region and why you need the money you need. And that then rolls up, seven or eight regional plans roll up into a national plan which brings all of those things together, looks at them all and starts to make the trade-offs uh, you know, between the regions when funding is constrained, as it always is. A um, couple of other key points here in New Zealand, the Office of the Auditor General um, if you like, representing the public interests of government and the community um, and a very important stakeholder, uh, not only for government organisations but local government ones as well. And, uh, you know, looking at how things are done and are we delivering value for money. Um, final point there, um, the AMP is very much an incremental process. Um, you know, it's, it's best begun simply and that's how it was done uh, back in, you know, the late 90s. And it's moved on over the years and it's now 
you know, regarded as one of the critical business documents of the agency by both senior management and the board. So, um, you know, it really has actually probably come of age, I'd say. Uh, next slide. So um, this is a picture, actually, at the bottom. Uh, you've got the, the web reference if you want to go and have a look at this. Um, so this is the latest uh, plan that was just published this year. Uh, it says 2012-15, but it actually takes a 10, 15, 20-year view. And on the left-hand side, those small words, if you can read them, this plan describes the services that our state highway system provides now and in the future, how we intend to manage the assets we use, and how we intend to fund the work that is needed. And I think that's quite a nice, simple encapsulation of what the plan is all about. And on the right-hand side, you can kind of see how the, if you like, the structure has moved around a little bit, and that just proves the point that there's no exact right answer to this. But there is a logic flow. You know, and it starts on the left-hand, top left-hand side about our services and what they are, the assets that we use, and rolls around through demand, performance, risk. Uh, and along the bottom, um, it's all about a reliable system. It's all about our maintenance and renewal. It's about making sure the highways are open 24-7. That's how we operate them, how we clear the snow. Um, and then it's about improving what, how do we improve the, uh, the network so that we'll meet the needs of future customers and then going around the loop through the continuous improvement cycle. So have a look at that one. Um, it's maybe generation four or so, uh, and it's, uh, it's quite a high-level document, but it's actually got some good stuff in it. Thanks, Diana. Thank you, Mark. Now I'd like to introduce Jeff Pike from Virginia DOT, and he's going to share with us Virginia DOT's asset management system vision while it's not called a transportation asset management plan, it is an asset um, management uh, plan itself. So he's going to share that with us. Yes? Thank you, Jana. Um, well, let me start um, by saying what, what we have um, done. What I'm going to talk about here is um, work that's been going on for two or three years at VDOT, and we started with this notion that uh, the current process and the current uh, system that we were using had kind of outlived its uh, usefulness. A lot of things had happened in the agency, and um, we needed to take a look at um, kind of where we wanted to be in the next three to five years. And so we started with this uh, objective of having a, a workshop with all of the uh, kind of management level people involved in the operations and maintenance functions at VDOT to get together and, and talk through some of the issues and try and develop a, a vision for where we wanted system operations to be in the future. And so we wanted to try and build kind of a um, foundation or a framework for how we would coordinate all of our processes going forward um, to streamline things and make it more logical. We, we uh, recognized that a lot of the areas that we needed um, some updating and improvement was in the data and systems area. So we developed a, what we call a business architecture review board that would look at the um, uh, serviceability of all of our current systems and also take a look at all new requ requests that would come in for enhancements to an existing system or for a new system and, and it make some decisions, I guess, about do, does it really make sense in the bigger scheme of things um, for us to move forward with some of those things. So that's kind of what the, the Architecture Review Board does. And then also to try and reduce some of the data and systems redundancies that we had. So the, the vision uh, workshops helped us put together some information to kind of establish, get everybody on the same page, a common framework for going forward. Um, it helped you know, ad uh, identify the gaps from where we were and where we wanted to be, both in terms of process and data and systems. And also then uh, some issues with roles and responsibilities came out of that. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So what did that look like for um, the, the attributes or the description that we came up with from our perspective on what a high-performing, transparent, customer-focused organization would, would be, would have these were the um, most common themes that came up from the workshop, that we would have clear policies and standards, we would have as close to real-time information 
as possible when guiding our operations. Um, we'd use data to drive decisions. We would integrate our systems um, to eliminate some of the uh, unnecessary steps in many of our data collection and, and uh, analysis processes. We would um, use feedback to learn what works and what doesn't work and improve that in our future planning and operations. We'd be performance-based, establish performance metrics and goals. Um, be proactive in, in terms of coordinating our work planning and not just be responsive. Um, empower people in the field to be engaged in this whole process since they know more than most of the rest of us how things actually get done. And uh, be flexible to, in order to meet the needs in the best way possible. So those were kind of the, the way that we characterized from the vision what, uh, what we wanted the future program to look like. And then in terms of achieving that vision, we said, all right, what are the um, functions within our organization today that um, are core to being able to achieve those things? We need to look at business planning and our need solution. Um, we need to build a performance management framework uh, or so take it further than we're so far. We need to have uh, process reviews and in continuous improvement. Um, look at the way we do programming and budgeting and data management and uh, evaluate whether we have the right kind of policies and directives in place and how, uh, look at how we actually do work planning and tracking and our communications back out. It's a large organization, so uh, just communicating back out to everybody to make sure we're all on the same page is a, is a challenge. So then out of that, we came up with our priorities for what we wanted to do and how to move forward with this thing. So the first thing we decided we needed to do was um, develop a data plan. Data was fundamental to everything. We felt like we needed to know uh, where we are before we know how to get to um, our goal, re achieve our goals. So we, w we needed a data plan. We needed to work on the system that we had currently to do a better job of uh, tracking and documenting accomplishments which again is fundamental to that feedback loop. Um, we, we did not at the time have on the GIS basis for um, all of our assets and our, and our work histories and data and so forth. So we needed to um, work towards building a, a GIS planning tool. Um, we needed to do much more with performance uh, based program development and policies. We'd done a pretty good job in the pavement and bridge area, but there hadn't been really much done in many of the other areas. So those were the, really the highest priorities that came up out of the workshops. And then others that were um, perhaps a little bit less of a high priority, we've got uh, to build or integrate the, the planning process on the maintenance side into a VDOT, what we call the six-year program, which is the construction of the capital pro improvement program um, for things, for major things like pavement and bridge reconstruction. We've got to figure out how to make our process integrate into that process. Um, we really had no one um, statewide inventory system, and we had bits and pieces of lots of information about different assets, inventory on different assets in many places, and we all agreed that we needed to have one central repository for that. Um, and we really just needed to um, go to a more modern maintenance management system than the one that we had had which was developed in-house back at the um, first part of the 2001, 2002. Um, and then some other initiatives were then take a look at some of the other software systems that we have, our, our equipment management system, our pavement management system, our plant mix scheduling system, um, programming management and budget, budget program, uh, and some of the decision trees in our asset management system we, that we did have uh, for a select few assets we had. Um, the ability to take condition data and run it through decision trees to generate some recommendations and, and turn that into a planning uh, tool for those assets. But it was piecemeal, and we really felt like we needed to have something more holistic. So, um, so we have that was how we approached planning for the future with asset management at VDOT. And over the last two or three years, that um, we have now a data business plan. Um, we are in the process of procuring an, a new maintenance management system. We've made huge strides 
with uh, developing our, the GIS basis for not just the inventory, but all of our um, activities, tracking work histories and activities in the field, and developing performance measures and um, processes around our uh, maintenance and operations program. We have a long way to go still, but I think that by doing this uh, planning up front, um, Guy has been guiding us over the last few years on uh, major investments in software and process improvement and data, which I think has been um, a great help to us. So I think definitely the doing the doing your homework first on planning pays off in the long run. Um, Jenna, I think that's about it for VDOT. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you to all of our presenters and participants. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Matt, uh, who's going to um, go to the questions. Sure. Uh, thanks, Anna. Um Two things I, I want to mention quickly um, regarding some, some, some AASHTO efforts or some NCHRP efforts. Uh, Yana mentioned the, um, the sort of the eight-step step process of coming up with the transportation asset management plan, with step one being the uh, conducting the self-assessment. There's an NCHRP synthesis uh, project going on, uh, 43-01, which is asking all of the state DOTs to basically conduct that self-assessment. So um, if you're the uh, state DOT asset management contact, um, you should be getting a request from the uh, contractor um, or a, a consultant doing that project, asking you to fill out a survey, and as part of that survey, the uh, self-assessment guide is in there. So that's sort of step one for everybody. And, and, and that overall project, we're just trying to get a get a better handle and understanding of how all the different state DOT uh, state DOTs are um, addressing asset management, what the status is. The second one, and uh, Mark uh, mentioned um, for uh, New Zealand how how they sort of uh, looked at bridges and ITS as a sort of unique or, or different type of, of asset. Um, NHRP 836 project, uh, task 114, is looking at the um, um, ancillary structures and how state DOTs are sort of um, looking at or addressing uh, ancillary structures from an, from an asset management perspective. Uh, that project is getting underway, and we should have results within the next, I want to say, six, nine, 12 months. Um, so we're trying to broaden the, the, the uh, research and um, uh, common practice of asset management to beyond pavements and bridges. Um, so on to the questions. Uh, let me open them up here. Um, a question for Scott uh, Rittrap. Uh, did you develop any cost models, cost versus level of service curves from real data to determine the budget needed to achieve a certain level of service? Yes, yes, we did, Matt, and um, the, the level of detail that we went to kind of varied with each asset, and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you right now, I mean, this, like Jeff said in Virginia, this is an ongoing process for us, and in fact, now we're developing a system because we realized that our enterprise resource planning software was great in assess costs and compare those to levels of service and develop, if you will, the, uh, the benefit cost curves that dictate how much money needs to get spent to achieve a certain level of service and how much money we're spending on an annual basis to maintain assets that are not in perfect condition and, and how, how that increases as the condition deteriorates. So we have done that, but we continue to improve that and refine that today. And in fact, in a project that we have, which will actually cross asset analysis, not in our enterprise resource planning software, but in our pavement management software, we will bring in information from the bridge program, from the maintenance levels of service program, from maintenance fleet equipment, and from our intelligent transportation systems assets to do more in-depth cost analysis in order to determine exactly how much we're spending in order to maintain assets as they deteriorate. Great. Thank you. Um, there's a, another question here sort of further down, Scott, uh, a few as well. Uh, let me just sort of ask that one. It says, um, was, the inter sorry, was the Enterprise Resource Program a homegrown program, or did you have help developing it? The Enterprise Resource Planning software that we use is SAP, so it's not even a United States homegrown program. And that was a, about an 18-month undertaking that we did with the help 
of a consulting firm. So we went through the procurement process, um, identified one of the big players in enterprise resource planning, whether you're talking about public sector or private sector, um, as the product that we chose to implement. And then we went through a separate procurement process in order to develop a consultant that could bring the expertise to turn that resource planning software into something that was functional specifically here at Colorado DOT. And I know that um, uh, other states have done development of that enterprise resource planning software in conjunction with asset management software, and they've launched them together. And, and, and I would point to them as great examples of how to do it. What we're doing today is we're taking the enterprise resource planning software that we launched in 2000 and have determined is not necessarily custom built for managing transportation infrastructure. And then we're taking our software that we use to manage our pavement program and we're now integrating the two over a 12-month project that will help us um, ensure that all the information that we store and collect and maintain and report on in the enterprise resource planning software is used in analysis with our asset management software, and then we can go back and take that information, push it back to the, the enterprise resource planning software so that our financial decision makers, our budget office, can provide the accurate reports we need to our transportation commission and others to know exactly what the impacts are of the financial decisions we're making. So it, it wouldn't necessarily be the model or the prototype that I'd recommend, but I think in the end we're going to have a product that we're comfortable with and that we like. Um, I might point to you know, Louisiana or Wyoming as great examples of states that undertook both projects simultaneously and probably will have a better integrated system than, than what we have right now in Colorado. And, uh, hey, it, Matt, I was thinking one of the things you can post on the website uh, is uh, um, all of the presenters, their phone numbers, and email addresses. So I can help you with that. Yeah, and that's what I, I was going to mention is that for, if anybody on the, uh, on the webinar wants more information or, or more detail or ask more detailed questions to any of the presenters, I think most of them are open to, you know, an offline dialogue via email, via, you know, telephone or whatever. And, will make their, their, their contact information available on the website, I guess, for good or for bad for them, uh, but uh, as a way to sort of, you know, ask, ask more detailed questions. I think that, that, that that's one of the benefits of this sort of peer exchange type type event where the peers, you know, asking questions to your, your, your peers and, you know, beg, borrow, and steal from them because we don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. Um, the uh, next question, I think, is, is probably geared to, uh, for, for perhaps AASHTO and uh, FHWA. It deals with uh, MAP 21. And it's a, is there an assumption that the camp outlined here um, will satisfy the six parts of the minimum plan requirements outlined in MAP 21? MAP 21 is the Senate reauthorization bill that just came out. Um, I know that there's a requirement there for states to develop a risk-based asset management plan. Um, AASHTO is going to be discussing some more of the details on Friday during a more uh, a lengthy discussion we're going to have uh, with a bunch of different people here, here at AASHTO. So I can't answer that, that question specifically at this point. Um, Steve, did you have, have you thought about what's in MAP 21 and whether the, 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 the guidance sort of provided in the, in the implementation guide would sort of satisfy those, those uh, requirements? You know, as I looked at what was in there, it looks like the guide is right in line. You know, anytime you have anything like this, or who knows what will, after all said and done, what we would see if it is, you know, authorized. And then you have a notice of proposed rulemaking process, et cetera. And, um, but it seems like what's in the guide is what's covered there. Yes. And, and uh, from, from Ashto's perspective, once once we know more, um, we will uh, sort of you know get information out to all the different state DOTs and stuff, and and also get their input um, into it. Um, next question is: uh, Is there a way to combine the TAMP with an agency strategic plan, or should they be kept as two separate documents? I think that. Um you know, it, it's not explicitly um, described in the guide, but um, but if an agency wants to have the two work 
more tightly together, um, I don't see why it can't be done. Uh, but the asset management plan is designed to, to focus on um, on the asset components that have that supporting any of the objectives that you would have as an agency. So yes, I think it can be done. Okay. Anybody else have, have comments about that? Any, any, any Scott or uh, Jeff? Or, or Mark, yes. who has a lot of experience with these. Um, oh, yeah, no, it's Mark here, yeah. I think, you know, I, I'd agree. I mean, typically, typically we see the asset management plan as kind of a document that links your strategy down with implementation. And if you've got a strategic plan, usually that's quite short, sharp, high level, and they'll give direction, which the AMP will then pick up. Um, but, you know, you, I think there's flexibility in that, that if an agency says, well, I think my asset management plan is my strategic document, it's going to define my strategies, it's going to give a high-level view of the assets, and it's going to kind of lead me through the risk elements and into, into programs, um, the answer is probably, probably okay. Yeah. Okay, two last questions here. Um, the, the first one is, um, can the presenters provide copies of their current uh, TAMP um, uh, the, the current asset management plans, and that's a, a sort of a question that I'm, I'm wondering as, as the subcommittee on, on asset management or ASHTO, um, as, as a resource of sort of going out and sort of catalog, not, not cataloging them, but pro, uh, providing web-based links um, on the um, subcommittee website, you know, for, so that people can go out and see examples of what, uh, what other states are doing regarding asset management plans. Steve, um, is this something that, uh, that, that FHWA has collected or anything, do you know? You know, at this, at this time, we don't have many asset management plans out there. Okay. Uh, what we will do, Matt, and let's work together, as we get examples, we can post them on our website, you know, it's highlight. If you Google FHWA, Office of Asset Management, the number of items posted on there, Federal Highway Reports, etc. You go to ASHTO, Subcommittee on Asset Management, this item is posted there, and there's also the website, which I call TAM Today. In between the three of them, what's out there, items are posted and will be posted in the future. Federal Highway is planning to undertake a study in the next couple of months where we'll work with a few state DOTs and working with them in developing asset management plans, and those will be available and posted on the website. You know, highlighted in today's webinar were the New Zealand Asset Management Plan, and I know Scotland's Asset Management Plan, which seem to be a bit more comprehensive and, and called as such that are worth looking at. You know, from Washington State, where they have documented, I don't know if someone documents, it's also something quite good. But yes, we will continue to post things out there and share things with the community. Maybe I can also highlight one other item. If you go to the Federal Highway Office of Asset Management website, and I believe it may already be posted on yours, Max, I know you're doing it, is an updated list of the asset management contacts in every state DOT. Just complement to what Jan and you said earlier, let that whole networking thing. You know, our goal from our office in the subcommittee on asset management is to advance the state of the practice. Any collaboration, stealing from one another that can be done, it, it's encouraged. All right, and then the final, oh, thank you. Um, the uh, final question is um, the, the focus, uh, the, the question is the focus is on states, but I think that the tribal nations are interested in starting asset management as well. And I would agree with that. I think that the, 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 the implementation guide and the principles in there are not, are not solely for state DOTs, but any sort of agency, um, you know, dealing with transportation assets that is geared towards transportation. Um, but, uh, you know, implementing an asset management plan for, you know, any sort of transportation agency. Anybody else want to comment on that one? No, I think that's right. So I, hey, that's, if that's I just do a comment for a second, I think we you know the state DOT people participating in a webinar, and I don't know how many of the MPOs are, 
you know, how we all work together in addressing this issue, you know, is, is to be determined. But the goal is how we manage our, our assets. Yeah. So, Steve, do you want to do the wrap-up? Okay. As we opened up today, we talked about what an asset management plan includes, and I saw how excited I was. I think you could see that this is the document that ties it all together and has quite a bit of attention out there. Somebody even mentioned, you know, the proposed legislation. And we heard different concepts that, that included look at the level of service. We're headed to a performance-based program. We certainly, as engineers, look at it meaning the an IRI or deficient bridges, element level, et cetera. But you also have that customer focus. You know, we even had the concept thrown out and there just mentioned as we go through the economic analysis, even the concept of value for money. Good information included in the guide and as we develop the plans, that sharing of information is important. I like the idea that Colorado talked about the book club and reading through the guide and what can your agency do or be doing better based on some of the case examples in there. I know we have another webinar coming up in two weeks. Looking forward to that as we look at some of the tools in the guide. Hear from you all back then. Matt, Yana, anything else to add? No. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next uh, December 14th. Okay. Bye. Bye.